Scanlon was, was an Irishman. He was born in Thurles, Ireland in 1843. Uh, this was during the potato famine, and uh, when he was uh, uh, preparing for the priesthood, he went to a, a seminary called All Hallows College, uh, and uh, that seminary had been founded with the idea of sending Irish priests all out around the world uh, to follow this Irish diaspora, this, uh, this scattering of Irish people who were starving to death in Ireland as a result of the potato famine. And many, if not most of them, of course, came to the United States. And so uh, he was ordained to the priesthood in uh, 1868, as I recall, and set out immediately for America. Uh, and uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, of course, was in the process of being built at that time, uh, but he was in such a hurry to get to California that he went down to the Caribbean and crossed uh, uh, Central America at, you know, across Nicaragua and took a ship on up the coast to San Francisco. So um, then he was assigned to a parish briefly, I think in Petaluma, California, and then uh, was uh, very quickly assigned to the mining town of Pioche, Nevada, which was one of the roughest mining towns in the West. And he served there for a while. And uh, uh, what happened in Silver Reef was, uh, it's not that far from Pioche. And uh, so when that big silver strike happened, a lot of those miners from Pioche moved down to Silver Reef and, and went to work there in, in those mines. So uh, Bishop Scandal knew a lot of those people. It, it was his old uh, parish of St. Lawrence in Pioche kind of transferred down to Silver Reef. So he was well acquainted with, uh, with many of those people. Why do you only preach of death? It's all damnation, and judgment, and hell? Why don't you preach hope or heaven? I do not set out to preach lightly. While I'm here, I'll preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and hope through his name, not mine. Join me this afternoon and I'll be happy to preach what you'll be willing to understand. So, Father, you're planning on preaching sometime today. Those mines of Silver Reef really began thriving. Uh, there, uh, there was this influx of miners, as I indicated, largely from Pioche, and many of them, of course, were Catholics. And uh, so he, he felt an obligation to provide some kind of pastoral care for them. You know, it was a long ways from Salt Lake, and uh, that's not the kind of thing you can just do with at the drop of a hat. It takes a lot of planning and logistics, and uh, presumably there probably weren't very many priests who wanted to go down there to the, what was essentially the ends of the earth to minister at this isolated mining camp. So, uh, so it was a pretty arduous uh, uh, undertaking. Well, John McFarlane, you would not call him an original pioneer out there farming. He came down and brought with him some skills, and particularly they were the skill of doing surveys. 
and the skill of music as a professional musician. And it's a Christmas carol that is famous well beyond the Utah borders, far, far away on Judea's plains. And the place where he did the surveying was Silver Reef. All kinds of mining offers uh, were going on over there. And so he spent many days each week at uh, Silver Reef. Uh, the story is that, uh, that he and McFarland would stay in the same hotel. And then over uh, uh, meals, uh, they discovered that they had a mutual love for choral music. my only book, but the only book I need. The name's McFarlane. May I join you? You must be the priest, Father... Scanlon. Father Scanlon. But what brings you to Silver Reef? I was summoned here by some old friends, but I believe for a divine purpose. What purpose is that, Father? Silver Reef needs a school. A hospital. It needs a church. I intend to bring it just that. How about you, Mr. McFarland? Please, call me John. I'm here surveying, trying to get a road through town. A road through town would be a noble cause. Not as noble as building a church, I imagine. I assume that's priority number one, or should be. Uh, we cannot get where we need to be without roads. You a religious man, Mr. McFarland. I'd like to think I am. And we just couldn't get it off the ground. It became apparent that we didn't have the skilled labor. And there were certain complications. Father Scanlon was bemoaning the fact that they didn't have a venue large enough to hold a Catholic mass. Their church was still under construction in, in uh, Silver Reef. Well, I have neither a church nor a choir. Father, I have a choir. And I am certain I have a chapel. Now, I would need to speak to some of the higher-ups in my congregation to get the horse pull in the cart, but I see no reason why you couldn't perform a mass. I, I don't know what to say. It would be an incredible blessing for my congregation, but I... I'm offering. What do you say, Father? And I'll take it to my congregation. I am. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, originally, the local bishop was asked about whether that would be possible and said, no, that wasn't possible. But John McFarland was uh, good friends with the Rasta Snow and he on behalf of Father Scanlon, ask uh, the Apostle Erastus Snow if uh, the tabernacle could be used for a Catholic High Mass. You know the Reverend out of Silver Reef, Father Lawrence Scanlon? Of course. He, he, he wants a chapel for his people. I offered him the tabernacle. 
I, I think it's an opportunity for us to serve. It'll be a great way to bring together our community. Now, I know the state John. president already told me there's no chance, John. But, but I think it'd be a missed opportunity. John, it's a wonderful idea. Set a date, bring Father Scanlon out to the big house and uh, have him prepare a sermon for his flock. Thank you, President Snow. Thank you. He instantly agreed and even hosted Father Scanlon at the big house, which is just north of here a block, where uh, Erastus Snow resided and invited him to, to come there and be his guest during the time the, the mass was held. And he instructed uh, John McFarland to teach the state choir all of the music that would be uh, necessary for the Catholic mass. So they, uh, the choir worked for some two weeks to to, uh, to learn all of this, you can appreciate this would be much different from their normal uh, uh, list of uh, hymns that they would uh, prepare. And I think he had 17 members in the choir initially, and there are 72 seats in the choir. <laughs> My speculation, and I, I want to be very upfront in identifying it just as speculation, is that McFarland wanted Scanlon to come to St. George and teach this Catholic liturgical music to his choir because they would not be exposed to that uh, from any other source. And of course, as you know, there's a long tradition of Catholic liturgical music. Uh, Mozart and Beethoven and especially Bach wrote uh, music for Catholic masses. And so, so uh, this would, I think, be a good exposure for his choir. He pointed out what a fabulous experience this would be to have lots of, of uh, St. George residents come and hear a Catholic mass in Latin and then have all these minors come down. The relationship of the miners to the people in St. George was not happy. And uh, so this would be a, a plus. And so on May 25th, 1879, in this building, a beautiful Catholic mass was held and Father Scanlon was just so impressed and pleased. Thank you. God bless. I think you're wrong, and you think I'm wrong. But this should not prevent us from treating each other with due consideration and respect. In the Holy Bible, in St. John, 
Chapter 4, verse 23, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. We are all gathered here today, seeking to worship the Father. We seek him in spirit and truth. And I just thought that message is every bit as applicable today in so many different ways. Uh, and uh, what insights uh, Father Scanlon had. So as far as I know, this is the only LDS tabernacle that's had a Catholic mass. An addition or an addendum to the story, in 2015, I received a, an email from a stake president in Italy who told me a story about a, a brother there who had had some contact with the missionaries some years before in Salerno, didn't join the church, but was interested in the people, in the, in the Mormon people. Ended up purchasing a book about uh, the, the Mormons. I think it was called, in fact, Meet the Mormons. And in that book, was told the story of Catholic Mass being held in the St. George Tabernacle. He was so impressed with the uh, kindness that the people of the LDS Church had, had offered his people, the, his Catholic uh, brothers and sisters. He reached out and uh, to a small branch of the church near Salerno, about 40 kilometers away, and, and uh, offered to play the organ for their services on Sunday. Now he played for the Catholics on Sunday as well, so he had to get permission from the Catholic father there to play uh, for the Catholics in the afternoon, and then he played for the little branch. On Sunday morning, he played the organ. And the stake president had been visiting the branch and, and asked this brother about, about it and just became so intrigued with this story. And this effort led to cooperation between the Catholics and the members of the LDS Church in this part of Italy. They performed concerts together each year and had a, a Christmas celebration together each year. So there's a lot of good that came out of that. So it just seems to me 136 years later to see this kind of come around and, and you kind of hear the rest of the story just really intrigued me how acts of kindness, you just never know what ultimately results uh, when you reach out and are kind to, to one another. For us Utah Catholics, he's He's our founding father, he's, he's our hero. And he's buried in the Cathedral of the Madeline, so when we go to Mass there, our great founder is going to Mass right along with us, and that just makes us feel great. <laughs> Meeting Lawrence Scanlon in this inn was most fortuitous. His immediate and immense desire to provide for his congregation resonated in me a desire to grow our community. Father Scanlon loved. He loved truly and honestly. There were many lessons to be learned from his sermons, but more lessons to be learned from his actions. Father Scanlon is most known for the Cathedral of the Madeline, an impressive and complex cathedral built in the heart of Salt Lake City, Utah. Under his direction, the building took nine years and was completed in 1909. Lawrence was my friend, my intellectual equal. Our conversations were filled with depth, and in all of our verbal transactions, it was increasingly evident that at the heart of our Mass, at the St. George Tabernacle, at the heart of all of his dealings, he cared about people. He wanted to provide for people. Father Scanlon was a stalwart individual. His mass at the tabernacle was but a small deed among his many great achievements. And I, for one, am grateful I got to be a part of that small deed.
John McFarlane was instrumental in allowing me to preach my sermon to my congregation and in allowing them a place to listen, to hear the hymns of God. John was best known for his composition, Far, Far Away, on Judea's Plains. That Christmas carol became globally known, and even nearly 150 years into the future, people from all over the world will continue to sing it. His legacy was far greater than any of his compositions. He laid the foundation for community and religious growth among the early settlers of Southern Utah. Even today, in your time, it will be said of our Mass in the Tabernacle that it was a little seed that opened the door to so many possibilities. For me personally, John McFarlane was my neighbor and my friend. Our friendship impacted me throughout my life, as I hope it did for him. He was more than a composer, a surveyor, an iron worker, my friend. He was all these things and so much more.